Now, your previous book, The Parasitic Mind, was a sensation. And when it came out, uh, I still see it referred to constantly online. It explores how parasitic ideas are spreading like a virus across the West, killing reason and killing freedom. But one of the things that confuses people on the left to this day is what do we mean when we say woke? So if I could get from you a definition of that word and if you could also explain to my audience why you say this ideology is poison. Well, it, it's parasitic because once you hold on to those beliefs, it is contrary to your best interest. So let me give you an example of what constitutes mm. a parasitic mechanism. So for example, the wood cricket is a cricket that abhors water. But when it is parasitized by a particular worm, neu neuroparasite called a hairworm, the hairworm needs to get the wood cricket to jump into water in order for it to complete its reproductive cycle. So once that wood cricket is parasitized by this neuroparasite, it merely jumps to commit suicide because it serves the interest of the of the parasite. And so in my book, The Parasitic Mind, what I argue is that human beings can also be parasitized not only by actual physical worms, they could be parasitized by ideological worms. So postmodernism, cultural relativism, radical feminism, transgender activism, uh, the rejection of biology in explaining human behavior, which I call biophobia, all of these parasitic ideas, when put together, create the walksters that you see walking around on university campuses. Well, one of the ranks uh, is Don Lemon, television host Don Lemon. Uh, he had his exclusive contract to host the Don Lemon show on X cancelled by Elon Musk just hours after his uh, premiere episode, which uh, featured Elon Musk. Uh, you very kindly gave Don Lemon some sage advice. Uh, can you share that with my audience? And, and do you think he will take it? Is, he, is it too far gone? Is the parasitic mind taken hold in, in, yeah. with Don Lemon? Yes, I, I fear that uh, my advice is impenetrable to his fully parasitized mind. Basically, what I told him is, look, you have the opportunity here to speak to arguably the person that most people would be most desirous to speak to, a, a truly historic figure who's done unbelievable things. And there are so many things that you could explore with him. You're given this opportunity, and yet, yet you can't extricate yourself from the gotcha strategies, from the accusatory tones and so on. What a wasted opportunity. And as I think we might talk about, just a few days later, it so happened, what, yesterday, actually, Elon and I had a conversation uh, on an X Spaces. So far, it's been watched, I think, tuned in by nearly 750,000 people. No accusations, no virulence, just two guys down to earth that hopefully have interesting things to say having a fun chat. And it was even fun in that we were debugging some of the features of, of the latest option on the X spaces in vivo, like online. So that shows you, you know, the humility with which we approached each other. And Don Lemon completely missed the opportunity to really have a wonderful conversation with a brilliant guy. And it was back on CNN within uh, minutes <laughs> to, uh, moaning about it, moaning about his uh, ex-contract. Uh, I mean, he's still allowed to be on, on the platform. His account hasn't been banned. Uh, tell me about that chat with Elon Musk. You were hosting it. He was one of the participants. And uh, I saw a bit of it. But uh, what did you learn? What, did, what, did, what came out of that that was most valuable for you? I think, I mean, there's specific content that was valuable in that I was asking Elon, you know, do you think that entrepreneurship proclivity is is due to nature or nurture? So we, you know, I asked him technical, interesting, you know, pointed questions. But I think what I got most out of it is a personal element, which is, you know, here's a guy who is, I, I suppose, the, the richest person who's ever lived. And if you see how down to earth he is, how humble he is, he was joking around with me, he was pranking me. We, you know, it, that's, I think, what was most remarkable about this guy, right? I mean, if you ever would think about someone who should have a chip on his shoulder, it would be Elon, and yet he was anything but that. And so I found that so refreshing, so invigorating, and uh, I think that's probably the thing that, uh, you know, made me feel the best about that chat. 
Now, Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson from the US Supreme Court seems to not understand the Constitution she is meant to protect. Uh, she expressed concerns that the First Amendment was hamstringing the federal government too severely. What do you make of today's shock revelations about uh, the Supreme Court justice uh, appointed by Joe Biden? So I'll begin, before I answer that, I'll go on an oblique tangent for a second. Until about 15 minutes ago, the 117 billion people who have been estimated to have existed on Earth absolutely knew the definition of male or female. But yet when she was being confirmed, <laughs> if you remember, she said that, you know, she's not a biologist, yes. so she couldn't, right? So if we have a Supreme Court justice <laughs> who's incapable of telling us what a woman is, then I'm not surprised that she's having some difficulties understanding the intricacies of the First Amendment mechanisms. But to answer your question more directly, th this is actually something that I speak about in The Parasitic Mind, the difference between deontological and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics are absolute statements of truth. So freedom of speech should be a deontological principle. You never say, I believe in freedom of speech, but... On the other hand, if your spouse asks you, mm -hmm. do I look fat in those jeans, then you could put on your consequentialist hat because then you might say, I'm going to lie to spare my spouse's feelings. But when it comes to foundational principles that are enshrined in the First Amendment, it has to be a deontological principle. And apparently our, ju uh, our justice, uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court justice is unaware of that distinction. So it was grotesque, uh, but it didn't surprise me. Uh, it is disturbing. It is disturbing to have someone in her position make a comment like that. It wasn't just one comment. The, 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 I've listened to the whole uh, questioning she had around that First Amendment and, wow, astonishing. Now, I want to ask you about musician Neil Young. Uh, he has announced he's going to come back to Spotify after he quit the site because of Joe Rogan and supposed disinformation. Uh, he got all sorts of excuses for the backflip here. But in the end, it seems when it comes to these celebrity opinions, they love to grandstand, but they also love money and they love that Spotify money perhaps more than their principles. You're right. And I mean, one of the things that I love to go back to Elon, and, and I think one of the reasons my voice resonates is because I think that we we really are driven by a set of principles and we don't deviate from them. But when you look at all of these imbeciles in Hollywood and all these actors and singers, they, they go with how the wind blows, right? And so when everybody was saying, if Donald Trump were to win in 2016, I'm moving to Canada, I live in Canada. I'm still waiting for Cher to move to Canada. She hasn't apparently moved to Canada yet. And so they, from this side of their mouth, they grandstand. And from this side of their mouth, they violate all of their, quote, principles. They're grotesque. They're idiots. They don't have a moral compass. Before you go, I have to get your opinion on how things are going in Canada. You're great and fearless leader, Justin Trudeau. Uh, what's the political environment like in Canada? And, and is that Trudeau in peril? Will he survive the next election? Well, certainly the polls are showing that he is in peril. And so if, if, if the elections were to happen tomorrow, I think that he'd be, you know, it would be, oh, dare I say a bloodbath? Am I allowed to say a bloodbath or am I calling for a oh, genocide? Oh, it, it, maybe I shouldn't say that. Yeah, well, it, it, it would be, it would be a massacre. Can I say that? Or that's also incitement to violence. But anyways, uh, mm. look, it Canada, don't say a landslide either, because that's frightening. It won't be a landslide yeah. either. Yes. Right. No, I think he would definitely lose. And uh, you know, I received a, a text a few days ago from Elon, a private one, where he said, "Hey, I wonder how is it that you could survive in Canada." with such rampant woke mind viruses. And so to your question, it's very difficult for me, not only to be in Canada, but to be within the university ecosystem in Quebec, because my own university, mm. there are many things that I love about it. It's very, very woke. And so it is definitely difficult to walk on my shoes on a daily basis, but I do it hopefully with a smile. Well, we rely on you, Dr. Sad and uh, Jordan Peterson to, uh to fight the good fight in Canada. I know there is others, but you two are leading the way. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Really do appreciate it.